Okay, today is all about using the, well, mainly about using the Springer LNCS template. The thing you've been waiting for uh, as you structure and write your assignment. So it can be a little bit tricky looking at the latest version of the template, the 1703 version, they seem to have fixed some of the problems from before. So with a bit of luck, <clears throat> it'll work better than in previous years. So what you first need to do is to go to the assignment section, or assessment section, and pick up the four, well, basically you download a zip, if you want to get it yourself, <clears throat> you go to Springer, LNC, Springer uh, website, you search for Springer LNCS template, and you get a big zip file, which unzips to produce those four uh, spread, uh, files there. Two of them are PDFs that tell you how to use it, and two of them are templates with the macros for ordering PC environment and for the Mac version there. How many of you have got Macs that you do your word processing on? So this year you're in luck. You've actually got a proper, probably working uh, version. So you, what you now do is you will download presumably all four of those onto your PC or your laptop or whatever. And you end up with a set like that in a folder you can call Springer LNCS. What you should then do is to take the Word version if you're using, sorry, the PC version if you're using a PC or the uh, Mac version if you're using Macs, and copy that into another folder which is where you're going to be working. The point here being, it's always a good idea to maintain your folders off a good folder structure. That makes life easy for you. <clears throat> and as some of you have observed or noticed, I have quite a well-developed um, folder structure <clears throat> under, for example, the module here. I've got a, a folder, high-level folder, <clears throat> for each year that I've ta taught this. And you can see that one for 2017, which has, uh, and then also one down here for 2018. And if you get into a habit of doing that, it will make it much easier to find the work that you're working on <clears throat> and keep it separated and all nicely catalogued in your head sort of thing and laid out like that. Once upon a time, under Windows, Windows 3, Windows 3.11, which is known as Windows Workgroup, the one of the very early ones, you could kind of structure your desktop quite nicely with nice little fold, effectively what are now folders, and you could put stuff inside, your, the various files inside a folder. You can't do that now. And what eventually happened was that people fill that area completely. <coughs> you drop your files there, you download files onto your desktop, you save files onto your desktop, and the thing fills up, and it's nearly impossible to find anything, isn't it, guys? Found that? Yeah. So what you should do is to build yourself, it could be in your documents folder that uh, Word, um, Windows so nicely provides for you, but build a good structure first. At least one, for a, a high level folder for each of your subject areas, and then sort of think about what sort of files you're putting there and what they're doing. Some of it may, may be coursework, some of it may be assignments. Let's separate them out. So here we are, we've now got the template sitting here neatly. This year, you can actually open it quite happily. You remember, you will need to enable editing, otherwise you can't do anything useful. You'll also and for most of you, certainly when you get onto the PCs here at the university, also you'll have to enable the content. That switches the macros on, because macros are all pretty much universally uh, disabled at start of a, a opening a document in case there are some malicious uh, macros sitting there that can do nasty things to your computer. Now we can trust this one, 
So enable the content. Now, what it comes with is an example of how it will look when you use it, after you put your stuff in there. You will see the same if you look at, uh, where is it, down here, if you were to look at the technical advice, and it gives you not in the LN, not quite in the LNCS uh, format quite because it, has, it misses stuff up here before the first section but it tells you what it's doing it also tells you about an old version the 1110 version which wasn't so good it broke horribly easily I don't know what the new one's like but it tells you how to use that one you've also got Guidelines for authors who are writing for the Springer uh, LNCS uh, formatted uh, books and um, journals. And so what you can see here is the title, the names of the authors, their attribution, that is where they come from, what universities or what organisations they work for. And you can see an email address. Then you can see an abstract and you can see keywords. Then it goes straight into the introduction. Now, I've told you that I want to see the introduction start on a new page rather than right next to the keywords. Because I want you to insert after keywords still on your free pages, which are not constrained by the three page limit. I want to see your table of contents there. Because I want you to get into the habit of producing well-structured documents where we can see in a table of contents exactly what you are doing, section by section, subsection by se subsection, because that tells the reader pretty much what the topics are and how they are relating sequentially along that golden arrow. And then there's more stuff there that gives you examples of what to do. <coughs> I don't want to see any footnotes, by the way, because that just eats into your work page allowance. It's not very useful. So here is then information they give you about using the, the whole um, paper formatting system and the way you should do it. So here we are in the template itself. So the first thing you need to do is just select it all and delete it, so you have a nice, empty document. And you won't be need, really needing to do that for another week, probably. You then find the document that you've got, which you've been working in and developing. Now, this actually comes from a final year uh, assignment that the student gave me permission to use as an example. So it's actually about six pages long, not three pages long, so we'll work through how you get it from um, the, other, the other version that it was actually looking like, it actually looked like this, formatted. He had actually formatted it nicely while writing it. So it's always worthwhile doing the headings one, two, and three, and everything else as you actually do the work. Because that helps you when you're reformatting it into Springer LNCS format. So what I've done effectively was to take that and what you can do, you can either do what I'm going to do now from here, control, copy, and then you can do right click and then you use that version. Paste special text only. Do not be even remotely tempted to use any of these three options. Because they will carry over <coughs> formatting from your source document into the template and it will mess up the formatting and all of the macros in the template. It will not work effectively. So. Go back to there, we'll now go to this version where I've just produced it in its raw text, no formatting version. 
I've also done something to the bibliography as well. I've messed up the sequencing of them, so Miroslav had actually sorted it properly, but I've got stuff out of sequence so I can show you what I want you to do. So, having selected all, control A, copy, then you go into here, text only pasting. Remember that. And it kind of looks a bit of a mess, doesn't it? Right. Now, what you will notice, by the way, I just need to switch off the collapsed ribbon so you can see what you're wanting. You need to look for Springer macros at the top left-hand side. <clears throat> and you will see all these buttons here do all sorts of useful things to format it. None of these is a straight style, which is what you will get if you go to those or there. So Springer Proceeding Macros <coughs> is the only set of, mac of formatting you use, except for one thing which I will show you as we go through. So first of all, we know that that was the heading. So where's the title? That's the title, sorry. And you'll see it brought in a hyphenation as well. And you'll often find when you do that pay special, you'll get some <coughs> random hyphens fed in. Maybe it's in the flowing of the text in your um, Word document. Maybe it happened otherwise. There's the name. So that is the author. University of Derby is the address. You could put School of Computing or the uh, College of Engineering Technology, comma, Derby, University of Derby. You will only put your um, Unimail address there. Now it's already broken, because that should have been centred. So we have to go and find the centre button there. <clears throat> and it used to do that last year as well. And when I was checking it out in my office a couple of hours ago, it worked a treat, centred it nicely, so it's unreliable. For the abstract, go back there and find the abstract button. Now this is where you see the power of the formatting macros. It finds the word abstract, if it can find it, and puts it there in bold with the right font, and the right font size. <coughs> The other thing you need to do at time is to switch on this little display formatting and you'll see that there's a spurious uh, line feed there that you don't want in front of keywords and you don't want that one there separating the email address and the abstract. So for keywords, you then pick up this slot, go back to Springer Macros and press the button for keywords. Now the fun part is, if you haven't put the word <coughs> keyword in front of the, your list of keywords, it will insert it in bold for you. But if it finds key, the word keywords, it will just turn it into bold. Now you see one of the next cardinal sins. To get to the top of the page, or near the top of the page, the guy just put in enter, 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 enter. And that meant that introduction was halfway down the page. So we don't want to do that, so control enter, and what you can see is the word page break comes in there. So now introduction is sitting at the top, and now I want to change this view slightly to make it a little bit easier. I want to see single, oh, no, I've got to see single page, which is about like that, yeah. Now because I've carried over as text only a properly formatted heading with the numbers in front, you have to delete that first. Highlight it from the side and press heading one. And it, add, it goes bold, adds white space around it as appropriate, and adds the number. Now, every paragraph or select collection of paragraphs must be formatted from scratch using the normal text button. Because what that does 
it left justifies or block justifies all of that first paragraph. You'll see what happens with succeeding paragraphs in the next section. So, take that bit out, and we know that that was another heading one, and that comes up with a nice new number. Now, what we have here are a set of little uh, paragraphs which now need to be formatted with normal text. And watch the difference with the first paragraph and the succeeding <coughs> paragraphs. The first paragraph starts right at the left-hand edge. All the other paragraphs start indented slightly. Now, if I undo that, and pick up, say, the first two or three, and do normal text, that's OK, and then do it with the next block, it actually, for once, actually leaves it correctly, which is kind of nice. It's actually working, again, working a lot better than last year. Now, this is a subsection heading, so it's a header two. Find the header two button. And then this next paragraph is one giant paragraph, which I don't recommend you do. It should actually be split somewhere around if we click on the button there, the whole thing just a single block. But that's a large amount of text to have as a single paragraph. It would work a lot better if we had a break uh, about there. But now you can see it's incorrectly justified. So let's see what happens if we pick up that, cop that one paragraph and redo it with normals it actually puts the indent in for you that it needs to. And we will be looking for that block justification first paragraph, indented second and successive paragraphs within a section. And that's the basis of the minus, I think it was 15% of the presentation mark for not using normal text button. That's three points off your overall score for the article. I noted it, you can break that macro fairly easily, and it turns out this year we have a new function up here, this new button here, which resets all of those buttons back to the correct styles and everything else and correct macros, which is kind of helpful. That's, an, again, something new this year, no doubt as a result of the continuous whinging from people like myself and you to... Uh, Springer, that their macros and their template wasn't very good. So, some progress, folks. I'll just do a, a few more paragraphs and then delete the rest down to the end of page three so you can see what you're doing. Oops. There's our page three, three pages. So there is the beginning up here of your three pages. And you'll see that you've ended up with a couple of, well, one page so far. And I'll show you what you have to do in a minute with your, now that you've got one, so one, two. Oh, we need to format this one as well.
So we've now got our three pages. What we also need to do is to insert, uh, what is the page numbers there? Bottom of page. Somewhere. <clears throat> So we'll get rid of the spare text that we don't need. And at this point, we then do control enter so that we have now got our pages. So that's okay there. And there's not much we can do about that. We may just be able to sneak that out. Yeah. Right. We now get rid of these spare line feeds. We can give that an H1 and then we can get rid of that one and then what we now do, who knows how to sort that bibliography? Okay, you go to the home set and with a little bit of luck That one there. Sort. Leave this exactly as it is, sorting by paragraphs, and click OK, and it all moves around nicely into the required alphabetic sequence based on the first name of the author. So it's basically taking that, well, it's actually looking at the whole text, in fact, but it, it will ensure that you get... Uh, we'd get Olaf's Route T 2014 before Olaf's Route T 2015 if there are two papers by the same author or same group of authors. That makes life very, very easy. Then you just go and click on the reference item. That's this one, which is the list of your references. And it will then number them nicely. Now, you will have done some work <coughs> with Plato, and if you look at Cite and Write and other guidelines for how to do Harvard references, which says that ideally you should then highlight the name of the uh, book or the name of the article. For this assignment only, you do not need to go to that effort. But normally you would expect to have to highlight that with a bold, uh, with that button, or using, uh, not there, you would use strong from that list there. Strong is the equivalent of a bold button here. For well, this one, yeah, most of these are, and you'll see that each of the web ones has an access date as well. If you've got stuff off the internet with a URL, the URL must be there and the date that you access it. The reason for that is that it proves that you did find it on that date. Now, it's unlikely that that, uh, that link will break in the two or three weeks that you're working with at the moment for this article. But if you're working in the final year <coughs> for your dissertation, you do your literature review in October, November of the year, and then you actually submit your dissertation about four or five months later, end of April, early May. Now during that time, some of those URLs might disappear. If that is the case, the fact that you've got the URL and you've got a PDF copy of that page or whatever it was you found at that URL, then you have the evidence that it was there and the date when it was there. And before you actually submit your dissertation, if there are things that have gone missing, you update all of the dates accessed to the night before you submit your paper or your dissertation. <coughs> That's why we have to have the date of um, access. Because it's the only proof you have, if it's gone missing, that, that it was there at that date, as long as you also have a PDF or some copy 
of that thing you found six months ago or a year ago. And so the reader will then be able to say, ah, all of these are still available, or at least they were available just before submission, and these ones were found and did exist six months before that. So it still means all of those sources are um, valid for you to cite during the writing. So now we have the last thing to do before we wrap it all up is then to give ourselves a single extra line. You'll have to change it back to normal and then you go to in this particular instance, yeah, you'll have to go to insert here and, oh no, it's references, sorry, reference, insert, table of contents, and you choose that first one. And as you can see, it's incredibly easy to create the table of contents provided that all of your chapter and section and subsection that are properly formatted with those with those headers one two and three or if in other documents you're using headings one uh, one two and three up here in the style bar what you can then do under normal circumstances after you've done some more work you've added some more titles subsections and such like you can do right copy <coughs> You can either update it, you, well, just do update the field, and it does, ah, oh, that's right, page numbers only, or entire table. Always do entire table, just like that. So now we can go back and switch off our display formatting. You now have beautifully formatted top there. One page, two pages, and three pages exactly three pages, plus zero, minus ten lines. It's within that ten line uh, spec. So there you have it exactly ready for you to work with. So then you do the final thing, file, save as, find a place, browse it, and then you give it a sensible name. So your surname first, maybe your initials, and then the name of what it is. Uh, and that was, I forget, cloud, for the sake of argument. Make sure it's updated <coughs> to the latest format or latest versions. Now the one thing you're going to have to work out and you'll have to check, I've not checked it yet, is some, if last year, um, Turnitin wouldn't accept a docf, docm. So you would then have to do a, another file save as uh, and do it as a Word document, not the macro enabled. The reason for that is that they can't do it is that they need to be able to create a perfectly formatted version of your um, article and if the macro, they will switch the macros off and if the macros aren't active, it may text flow wrongly, may throw the, everything off. And one of the other things that you end up with, you have that error message as well, sometimes you will find when you go to your table of contents when it gets into Turnitin, in its PDF format, as I mark, that some of these page numbers suddenly go missing. And it says, what's it, um, key, I forget, it's keyword or, or something like that missing, <coughs> or field missing, because it can't read inside uh, the, mac the disabled macros. So, save it as the final stage, just before you submit it, as a bog standard, ordinary, uh, word file, a docx. Get rid of the docm version and then it will work. Any of you, if any of you use unusual cloud-based storage systems, OneDrive, I'm not sure whether that works well or not. 
Uh, Google Drive sometimes works <coughs> properly. Sometimes it won't work because you password protected it and it can't open the file properly because the password is not known to turn it in. So get it, that final docx version, that final word version onto your local hard drive and then submit it to turn it in from your hard drive. That makes life a lot less difficult for, in some cases, I mean, I've had occasions over the last couple of three years, particularly last year, where people were submitting straight out of their cloud drive, whatever it was, and they just kind of gave up. And I couldn't actually read the doc, the actual submitted file either, uh, when I wanted to have a look at it, see what was going on. <coughs> so always resave it as a docx, eventually onto your local hard drive, log into course resources, into the submission point, and submit it from your hard drive. That will solve all the problems. Okay, that's how to do it. Any questions, folks, about the process? Okay, well, I'll make that available as soon as I can. I'll also download a video version of it, and I'll put it up on YouTube as well and give you that as a, a link just in case you want to go over it again. So that's that. Now, before we finish, because it's only half past, there was, I want to briefly look at some of the things we were doing. I want you to prepare, to think about preparing for next week's lecture. First of all, I'll stop this so it...